those that separate the church because of their schismatism, because of their denominationalism, because of their sectarian pride and rivalry, are harming the cause of the church and the kingdom. They are doing the work of the devil. So I just want to make an appeal to you. If you're someone who is bought into ethno-nationalism, I want to point out to you that it's a failed ideology and it is failing Europe, it's failing European civilization. Because you can't root a civilization in genetics. A civilization is art, a civilization is learning, a civilization is politics, a civilization is values, a civilization is doctrine. And the thing that has given us our civilization, that has made European civilization the jewel of the world, is its Christian faith. It is a muscular Christianity that we need to return to. It is a muscular Christianity that we need to adopt. Not that kind of weak, liberal, progressive nonsense that you see on the BBC, but a strong Christian identity as a Christian people rooted in a Christian history and Christian values and Christian doctrines with a sense of what the history of the church is. That is what we need in Europe to answer the malaise of liberalism, to answer the, the decayingness of modernity, to answer the rise of a radical, uh, resurgent, confident Islam. This is what we need in Europe, a muscular Christian faith. I want to talk now against schismatics, against those who would divide the church against itself. And I want to give the reason why Christians should abhor schismatics and those that divide the body of Christ. And I'm going to give some reasons. So reason one, unity within the church, that body of Christ, that holy people, that people of God, that nation that is made up of those who are disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, gives the church strength. It gives us strength socially. It gives us strength economically. It gives us strength politically. The reason why Christians are so weak is because we don't have a sense of our own identity. And even when we do, we divide that identity in sectarian lines which diminishes our presence within society. It diminishes our presence within the socio-economic and political culture. The fact of the matter is that the liberal society bends around, it bends around strong identities. And the church needs a unified identity to take ground socially, to take ground economically, to take ground politically. Without that unity, we are simply played off against one another, or most of us are not even inspired by the idea of taking ground at all. Unity is strength. It allows us to advance common causes, like the fight against abortion, the fight for the common rights of Christians, such as keeping the Sabbath. It unites us around things like defending our understanding of the family, standing up for the poor, observing the Sabbath, standing up for persecuted Christians. Without that unity, we as Christians are less effective. Now, the second reason why the second the second reason why I'm against schismatics and those that divide the church against itself is that when Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia and Corinth that were all beset by doctrinal problems. I mean, they are reactionary letters. They're letters of correction to false teaching. He didn't say to the church in Galatia, go and set up a new church. He didn't say, be schismatic. He didn't tell them to withdraw and establish new institutions. What he did is he stood up to the false teachers. He called for the false teachers to be excluded. And that is what as Christians we should do. Rather than constantly trying to separate ourselves into something that's pure, 
which will ultimately fail and just result in another impure church. Instead, we should stand our ground within the politic of the church and fight for the church to be orthodox. That is what we should do. The splintering within the Reformation has occurred because they tried to reform the church from the ground up and they failed. They should have fought for reform of the church from within and that is what we should do. Paul taught against schismatic attitudes. He doesn't counsel schismatic attitudes. The third reason is that the Old Testament prophets, when they preached the corrections of Israel, despite its waywardness, you'll just have to forgive the noise in the background, someone's getting a camera lesson. The Old Testament prophets did not teach the idea of breaking off into a new Israel. They taught the idea, they spoke out against false teaching. They called the Jewish people to maintain their monotheism. And that is what we must do in the church. The problem of false teaching is a problem of discipleship. And the response to heretical teaching is better discipleship within the church. Not schismatism, not separation, not setting up new churches. In 2 John, in 2 John, we have in verse 7, we'll just go to it. In 2 John verse 7, it gives the criterion of what it is to be a Christian. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. That is what qualifies you as a Christian, to acknowledge that the divine Son of God, and if he is a son, he has a father, has come in the flesh and has thus promised the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to be a Christian. It isn't about your views on the Eucharist or your views on Mary or your views on baptism or your views on free will or how many books you think are in the Bible. None of these things are spoken about in the Bible as the thing that defines you as a Christian. The things that define you as a Christian are what you think about God, what you think about Jesus. So keep the secondary issues secondary and the primary issues primary. Don't confuse the two. Schism and schismatism is taught against directly in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. I've taught on it before in other videos, but I don't mind doing it again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we read this. Now I exhort you, brethren, that by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions amongst you, but you do, that you be made complete in the same mind, in the same judgment. Now bear in mind, he's writing to a church that is already divided. So we shouldn't be surprised that if the church was divided in the first century, that we will find it divided in the 21st century. The idea of being of the common mind, of the common attitude, is an exercise of will. It is an exercise of tuition. It is an exercise of discipleship. It is about something that you do proactively. It is not about something where you emphasize the differences and divide yourselves, but that you emphasize that which unites and you stand on Christ, which is the cause of our unity. In Matthew 13, our Lord teaches a parable. And he says this, starting from verse 24. 
The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to them, Do you want us then to go and gather up? But he said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot, uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. Now our Lord gives the explanation of this parable. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of God. The tares of the, are the sons of iniquity. And the harvest is the day of judgment. The sons of God are the church. The church is in the world. Which means that institutionally, the world will be in the church. If you try to separate the world at an institutional level from the church, you will fail. And history has proven this again and again and again. How many separatist churches separated themselves from another church because of some point of doctrine or practice and then ended up being every bit as compromised as the church that they left? Why? Because human institutions are in the world and the church is in the world in its institutions and so the world is in the church. You have to let the two grow together. If the world is in the church, you have an evangelistic field. Disciple them because they've already identified as being Christian. Finally, the church in John 17, 21, our Lord prays, prays for. He says this, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me. Our unity as Christians is about what we believe about Jesus. Through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Christ prayed for his church to be one. That is our aim. That is our goal. And our unity is built upon what we believe about Jesus our Lord. That unity is something that will convince the world that Christ sent, that the Father sent the Son. Those that separate the church because of their schismatism, because of their denominationalism, because of their sectarian pride and rivalry, are harming the cause of the church and the kingdom. They are doing the work of the devil. It is no surprise to me that many of the most sectarianist Christians who have come to the park and stirred up sectarian division amongst the church here are no longer present. They don't come anymore. They've done their damage and they've left. And I call for Christians in the park to unify on Jesus Christ, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, to proclaim him as Lord and Saviour, and to end all these petty rivalries about secondary doctrines. Now, on a practical point, how can we live out this kind of unity when our institutions are divided? Well, the answer is simple. It is not by unifying on institutional grounds. It is about unifying upon common causes. Unify on supporting the persecuted church. Unify on proclaiming the gospel. Unify on opposing abortion. Unify on defending the marriage family as defined by the apostles' teaching. Unify on standing up for the rights of Christians to practice their faith. Unify on helping the poor in the name of Christ. There's enough things to unify on. There's enough things to stand together on. And if that unity creates unified institutions, all the better. 
But don't fall in with sectarianists. Don't fall in with division. Because you're hurting the church when you do.